2022, the year where I decided to start tracking every game I own, buy, and play. Not only that, but I also decided to rank all of them too. That's right, every single game I played this year. That includes every single player game I completed, and every multiplayer game I felt like I knew well enough to form an opinion on, with the exception of a few games I felt I knew well enough already to go ahead and put on the list. To be upfront, these aren't games that I feel are better or worse, they're just games that I have an overall higher enjoyment of over others. Where will older games like Shantae and the Pirate Curse land compared to newer games like Sonic Frontiers on the ranking? Let's find out! Hi, I'm Club, and welcome to Club's Hub. It's it's just real funny to me that I spent months and months of my time learning 3D modeling and planning the creation of this channel just for the first thing that that VCR animation to be used on is a game like Color a Dinosaur. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Okay, yes, uh, Color a Dinosaur for the Nintendo Entertainment System. I, I guess the first question is, why did I play such a game? Well, you see, there's this podcast I listen to called New Game Plus, where they play a random retro game every week, and I heard them mention this game, and I just had to check it out. It's, uh, probably the worst thing I've ever played. Like, what you're seeing right now is the entire game. Why did someone think it would be a good idea to take a physical activity like coloring and digitize it in the 90s? Look what I made, Grandma! Oh, that's great, dearie. Here, let Granny just hang it up on the fridge for you. <coughs> in the mood to play a horror game, but you want it to be super short so you don't have to come back to it later? How about a game that you remember being bad, but you gotta play it again just to make sure? That's pretty much my entire experience with this game. Now, I've played a lot of very short fantastic horror games like Slender the Arrival and Layers of Fear, and this game's initial aesthetic of taking place in an amusement park is extremely appealing to me, but this game really falls apart with its terrible pacing, cheap scare factors, and honestly, the scariest part? It's horrendous storytelling. The main premise of the game is you're trying to find your son who runs into the park looking for his stuffed bear, and you keep getting on different attractions looking for him. To help with that endeavor, there's even a call out to your son button, similar to Jason! Wait up there for mommy, Callum! Jason! Stop, Callum! Jason! There's one part early in the game that really sets the mood for the whole story, where you chase your son onto a swan ride, where the game then proceeds to recite the entire story of Hansel and Gretel to you for a whopping seven minutes, and then just ends the ride with Ooh, I'm shaking in me boots! I mean, feel free to try this out for yourself if you think you'll get better enjoyment out of the story and gameplay than I did. It's only an hour long, so it's not a hard ask of a game to play, especially if you want a cheap scare. It's just... <sighs> I think Five Nights at Freddy's did a better job being scary with their costume mascot characters. <laughs> Astro Bears, Astro Bears, Astro Bears, it's 3D Snake. Alright, to be fair, it's multiplayer 3D Snake, and to be even more fair, this is the party variant that only has one multiplayer mode. I didn't even know there was a different version of Astro Bears until I started writing this video, and I bet none of you have even heard of Astro Bears until now. Well, uh, you're welcome. Astro Bears! <sighs> Some of you who know me knew this was coming, and for those of you who are just now getting to know me, I'm sorry, but I really don't like this game. And I've given it a fair chance, playing it all the way through by myself and again on stream, but I just don't get the appeal. And just so I'm honest here, this is one of the few games on this list that I didn't actually play in 2022, but there isn't a snowball's chance in hell I'm playing this game again anytime soon. So I decided to go ahead and rank it. Now I've exhausted my hatred for this game on multiple occasions, 
but since the channel just got an uplift, I'll quickly summarize. While the aesthetic, music, and combat system are overall well made, the actual game suffers from a ton of old RPG traits that makes the game extremely unfun. Random encounters, an unnecessary amount of grinding, no XP share, and an abundance of repetitiveness leading to a boring game loop. In fact, the entire game is based on doing the same thing over and over again. Go to a town, watch a cutscene, go to a dungeon, fight a boss, watch a cutscene, and then do that 27 times. I hope you love doing the same thing over and over with no change for 60 plus hours with tons of unnecessary fighting that forces you to go out of your way just so you can be reasonably strong enough to fight the next boss. Also, there are 8 characters each with a completely different story with no rhyme or reason as to why any of the other characters are present for that one character's story. So one character could be a morally good merchant doing their morally good story with a thief just chilling in their party helping them out cause, well I don't know, cause you told them to? It just doesn't make any sense. The whole thing just feels incredibly disjointed and unplanned all the way up to the end. But the music's phenomenal, so I guess I'm playing Octopath Traveler too. Oh, Pokemon, you sweet, sweet, plain, rancid bowl of oatmeal. Like I said in my Pokemon Scarlet video, me and Pokemon go way back, but I could never get into the games past Pokemon Crystal. After trudging through Pokemon Sword, I thought that the first open world Pokemon game would be the thing that would bring me back in, and it almost did. You see, Arceus is such a great idea for a Pokemon game. Fully open world, minus the loading screens between areas, where you throw Pokeballs and you catch Pokemon without even having to fight them. And like, that's cool and all, but that's the whole game. Like, that's it. I guess there's also bosses, but it's really just a disguise for you to throw more things. I guess you could say the game could have been called Pokemon Legends Throwing Balls. I don't know. There's also an attempt at a story, but it was so boring and uninteresting that I completely gave up on it halfway through the game. It doesn't help that everyone is just so plain and lifeless and move like the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. At least in Pokemon Scarlet, you can tell what kind of personality someone has based on the way they are animated or act. But in Arceus, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> this character is my favorite because he has a hat! Before we get to 60, I want to pause for a second to explain these title cards for each of the games if it wasn't already obvious. Title, console I played it on. Main story means I only did the story and nothing else. Main story plus extras means I did the main story and side quests. And 100% means I did everything I could, or at least till I got the platinum trophy. Then we have the dates when I was playing this, and then how much time I put into the game if I have those numbers available. Last thing, this symbol means this was the first time I played the game, and this symbol means that I've played the game before. Clear as mud? Good. Let's move on. Ah yes, 2022, the year of Shantae. For some reason this year, I had a real hankering to play through all the Shantae games. I never played any of them, and this seemed like the perfect year to do just that since I was working on this ranking. The first Shantae game has a lot of rough edges that are pretty hard for me to look past. The transformation system is super janky, enemies take way too long to kill, and about 90% of the game, I'm completely lost. If memory serves me right, I think this is the only game this year where I had to use a guide the entire time I was playing because I just couldn't tell where to go for half the game. I honestly feel that way with a lot of older games. There are rare occasions where I have no problem figuring out where to go or what to do, but most of the time I'm completely lost. I think it may also have to do with the fact that games nowadays are so handholdy that I'm not used to the old way of doing things. But it certainly doesn't help when you're playing on a console no bigger than your hand. All that being said, WayForward had a pretty decent idea here, with amazing music, fantastic characters, and a decently solid story. The dungeons were pretty great too, since they were more contained, but overall the game kind of left a weird taste in my mouth. I think... I think that's sand. Well, let's just hope that they really blow me away in the sequel. Oh, a 
Okay, so they did make a ton of improvements visually to the game. Better UI, better transformations, better dungeons, music, and character models, but the world got more confusing for me to traverse. At least this time there's a map, but look at this thing. I can't make heads or tails of it, let alone know where to go from it. Again, this is probably a problem with me more than the game, but it's hard for me to pitch this game when I can't even properly navigate the world. When I went into the Shantae series, I was told that these two Shantae games were the weaker of the two, and I have to agree with that. But I wanted to experience all of the Shantae games so that I understood the full scope of what the series had to offer. Either way, I didn't let these two games deter me from the franchise, and I'm glad I didn't, because as you'll see later, the last three are 100% better. McCoy. Wait a minute, that's not Steve Harvey. I love game shows so much. They remind me of when I was a kid watching shows like The Price is Right, Whammy, and Lingo. You guys remember Lingo, right? Yeah, no one does. But I always loved Family Feud until I tried to play it myself. If you ever play this game, don't play it by yourself. It's super unfun because you have no one to help you work out the answers to the stupid question that you definitely know the answer to, but you're too stupid to think right now. We asked a hundred people, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Uh, oh gosh, oh, I know this one. Uh, ugh, I don't know, an oak? Not an oak? Uh, um, uh, 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 um, uh, a sycamore. Oh gosh, um, I know this, oh, I know this, uh, da, 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 um, da, 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 rainbow eucalyptus. Who would have thought? Honestly though, Family Feud is pretty fun. It's just that this particular version of the game is so unbelievably slow and not really my go-to couch co-op party game. Literally every single time you boot up the game, even if you do a rematch, Lucky has to explain to you how to play the game every single time all over again and it's kind of exhausting. What did you think of this game, Lucky? Shit. Couldn't have said it better myself. Kirby just can't help but to be cute in literally everything he does, including being a fat piece of shit. Kirby's Dream Buffet was a surprise release Kirby multiplayer game that came out to the Switch in 2022 where you race people online as a roly-poly Kirby eating strawberries and various other foods to be the fattest Kerbo of them all. While the initial ooh and ah of this game is pleasant, it isn't until about hour two or three where you realize you've just been doing the literal same exact thing over and over again. Now that's usually the case with a lot of multiplayer games, but this game is quite literally the same thing. I believe there's about 10-ish different courses and many games, but they all feel very samey the more you do them. And there really isn't a ton of payoff other than new looks for Kirby. Don't get me wrong, this game was very fun to play, but after a few hours I was like, <laughs> alright, I, uh, I get it. Eh, time for something else. I remember this game fondly, riding in the back of my parents' car, playing this game on a dimly lit Game Boy Advance SP, silently thinking up every curse word I knew as I fought Wario, like darn, freak, and butt. This game is kind of a bop. The whole game is filled with tons of great levels, fun bosses, and jamming music, but the game suffers from a weird difficulty curve. Half the game you're flying around like <laughs> Then you get to the final level and you're like, please lord, when will my endless suffering come to an end? The final level is this endless gauntlet of difficult platforming with a three phase boss battle and not a single checkpoint? Like what? I actually don't remember this final level being that difficult as a kid, but I must have suppressed all those memories like I did for Bubsy. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it's me, Donkey Kong, from the hit game Donkey Kong Country. <laughs> and here's my little buddy and his girlfriend Diddy Kong and Dixie Kong from the hit game Donkey Kong Country. Hey guys, what about me? <laughs> 
Yeah, this game kind of blows, huh? Okay, that's a bit harsh. It's not that bad. I, I mean, I did put it at 55, but it does have some super amazing platforming and really fun levels for an overall pretty well put together package. But the lack of David Wise music and the repetitive level aesthetics makes for a super meh game for the Donkey Kong Country series. I feel like Rare did an okay job with this game in the long run, but there's probably a reason the Donkey Kong Country series was put on ice after this game. It also doesn't help that Kitty Kong is an abomination that should be hunted for sport. ever have one of those games from your childhood that you liked but no one else had heard of it? Yeah, no, nah, me neither. Ever since I saw an ad for Cyber Chase on the movie's DVD, I wanted to play this game. I got a copy as a kid and I fell in love with it. Nowadays, as an adult, this game controls like Scooby Doo Doo. I guess my supple child brain was able to just work my way around some of the platforming in this game, but it really does have some janky controls. Outside of that though, the actual level design and aesthetic of the levels are super interesting, having you jump from feudal Japan to prehistoric age to amusement parks and so on. They even give you the ability to kill skateboarding children with pies! Nice to see they continue the trend of making Shaggy an undefeatable being with the power to destroy all who oppose him and his never ceasing unlimited power. Yeah, they didn't have to make this, did they? I mean, it's just Wii Sports, so it's pretty fun, but this just feels slightly unnecessary. I guess it does have online multiplayer, and it does have some pretty fun cosmetics you can get, and it did find a way to streamline along with the longer games, and it does let you be a fan of dog. You know what, this isn't half bad. Really what it comes down to is whether you have a craving to play this game online with friends all the time, or if you just simply don't have a copy of Wii Sports. Or or if you want to play volleyball, cause let's be real here, best new addition to the sports games. Other than those things, this game is a very easy skip if you're not interested. Hey, I love Captain Toad and puzzles. This was a game I had been wanting to try out for a while, purely because the Captain Toad segments of Mario 3D World were some of my favorite moments. And after finally getting to play this game in 2022, I gotta say, it's pretty alright. It's an overly charming game with some pretty challenging puzzles. Really the biggest problem I have is that it just doesn't come off as a game I would want to return to anytime soon. Most of that stems from the fact that I feel like the appeal of the toy box-esque puzzles tends to wear off after a while. And it's not like the game is too long, it just feels like the main mechanic of the whole game just overstays its welcome for a little too long. Like that last family member on Christmas who won't take the hint and just GET OUT! Yes, yes, I know this game is incredibly low on the list, but we're starting to get into the games that I adamantly enjoyed, but just couldn't bring myself to put them any higher than the games above them. I think the thing for me when it comes to Limbo is that I feel like I've played better games than this in the past, like Little Nightmares and Inside, and I just so happened to play this game for the first time this year and wasn't particularly wowed by it. It's a great game, don't get me wrong, but everything in the game to me just feels so weighty, and there are several moments where I was getting frustrated because I had no idea idea what the game was wanting me to do or what it was trying to teach me. A pioneer for these types of games and a game I can appreciate, but definitely not one of my favorites. Wow! 
What is this game doing so low? Further proving what I said in the limbo section, we're literally already getting to the good stuff. I'm a huge fan of the Crash Bandicoot series, and I have been since I was a small marsupial, but this game is very low on the totem pole for me. Let me be clear, when I played it this year, I specifically played the Crash Insane trilogy, but I personally feel like the games are so close to the original that I'd rate the games individually instead of the compilation as a whole. The first Crash game is one of the biggest developments in 3D platformers, right up there with games like Mario 64, but I really feel like its levels don't age well. It's hard for me to come back to this game purely because of how difficult it is and how much it asks of you in order to complete everything. It is still, to this day, the only Crash game from the original three I haven't completed, and I don't really have an interest to, especially after they added time trials in the remake. This game may have given me my favorite animal character in Evil Scientist, but it also gave me the stupid f***ing piece of sh bridge level! Yeah, Shovel Knight! One of the first indie games I ever played and a franchise I fell in love with immediately, owning it on several different consoles and playing it a million times. I decided to revisit Shovel Knight and all of the DLC stories this year since I was doing this ranking, because I wanted to see where my opinion landed on all the three different stories. Basically, Yacht Club Games gave us three extra stories outside of the base game where you can play as bosses from the game, and while at first I thought this would be the same exact game and levels with just a reskin to play as the boss, I was sorely mistaken, as each DLC story is practically a standalone game. Plague of Shadows was their first attempt at this, and in my opinion, the weakest one. While Plague Knight is a lovable idiot and the level design is just as top notch as the base game, I found the actual gameplay as Plague Knight to not be as enjoyable as it was to play as Shovel Knight and the other boss knights. Plague Knight's way of fighting is very slow and hard to hit enemies, since he goes for more of a ranged approach than an up close approach like the other knights do. It really makes Plague Knight stand out as a black sheep of the bunch and not in the best way. Still a great game, but overall, all slower paced for my taste. Ah, the Xenoblade Chronicles franchise, a series that's near and dear to my heart. A series filled with amazing music, fantastic characters, interesting combat, and phenomenal stories. A series with humor, love, sadness, heartbreak, and friendship. And terrible pacing. You're a bastard. What the heck happened with this DLC and how is no one talking about it? They have this fantastic story build up and a ton of great gameplay mechanics for all the new characters you're playing as, and then at the last minute, right before the final fight, oh I'm sorry, but you can't fight the final boss until you do every side quest in the entire game. What? I think they were trying to get me to feel empathy for all the side characters I was about to help before the finale, but it made me angry to help them and I couldn't wait to see their final fate. This DLC still ended with an absolute banger of an ending though, so it's hard for me to complain too much. But man, that pacing at the end, what the heck? Well, I'm sure whatever game comes after this will be very justified and not something completely out of left field for no particular reason, right? Hmm. B? There are three Bs. Hmm. Gosh, I, I know I've seen this before. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Uh, oh, I'd like to solve? Club may be the studiest d -d person alive. Aww. Listen, I love Wheel of Fortune. I'd probably go as far as saying it's my favorite game show, and this game on the Switch is actually a ton of fun. Probably the best game show video game out there right now. But it's also Wheel of Fortune. Like, that's it. If you don't like Wheel of Fortune, then there's little to no reason to get this game. Also, to address the elephant in the room, yes, I'm very aware that I put this game above a well-written RPG. Trust me, this isn't the first time you're going to be seeing weird games side by side like this. La 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 la
What a weird game. Katamari Damacy was a game that I was always aware of, but never really had any interest in playing until I saw somebody wear a really cool shirt. That's it. I saw the shirt, the game was on sale, I wanted to give it a shot. The game oozes Japan. It feels like the entire time I'm playing I'm on some weird exotic acid trip. But the gameplay of rolling up the world in a giant ball that's slowly getting bigger and bigger while jamming to some of the best songs I've ever heard makes for a pretty chill time. I feel like this game is on the cusp of suffering of the same overstaying welcome feeling, but just barely avoids that with how overly satisfying the actual premise of the game is. The only real complaint I had was how rough the controls felt, but after about three-fourths of the game, I finally got a full grasp on them. Maybe I'll pick up the sequels in the future. I'd be curious to see if they made any improvements. Wait a minute. Do you guys hear that? Ah, this hurts more than I thought it would! You know, I remember when I was playing Octopoop Travel Turd for the first time, I needed a palate cleanse, so I went and bought a copy of Yoshi's Woolly World and fell in love with it. It was such a nice, calm, relaxing game to unwind to, so when Yoshi's Crafted World came out, I was just as excited to dive into the world of pure Yoshi bliss. This game is just as charming and lighthearted as its predecessor. With artfully made environments and creative level structure, my only problem with the game is that I think it's just a tad too long. It kinda has the same issue Captain Toad does, where I think the idea gets a little tiring after a while. It probably doesn't help that I rushed through the game in four days though. The music in this game also doesn't come off quite as charming in my opinion as it does in Wooly World, but other than that, a solid game that I'd love to come back to in 100%. Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain! I can't hear you! Aye, aye, Captain! Oh! <laughs> I like this game. I didn't personally grow up with Battle for Bikini Bottom, but I did grow up with Spongebob, and I grew up with Heavy Iron Studios' other fantastic game, Scooby-Doo, Night of a Hundred Frights. So when they remade this game, I had to check it out, purely because one, it was Spongebob, two, it was a 3D platformer, three, it was made by Heavy Iron Studios, and four, it was a collectathon. The perfect recipe for a game I had to 100%. Plus, my wife really likes it. Are you talking about Battle for Bikini Bottom? Yes, boo. You'd better have nice things to say. If you're a fan of those older Spongebob seasons, then this game is perfect because it is absolutely riddled with humor and references that harken back to the good old days of Nickelodeon cartoons. It has some pretty solid levels and platforming, great controls, and for a collectathon, it didn't feel too long or overly stuffed full of needless things to collect. It's an overall well-rounded game from start to finish. Wait, why is it only at 44? I don't know, I just like the other games above more than this one. Don't you have to be stupid somewhere else? Not until 4. You know how most people have those obsessions from their childhood that don't go away? Like dinosaurs, or ninjas, or robots, or BIG LOUD TRUCKS! Well mine is pirates! I love everything pirates! Peter Pan, Sea of Thieves, pirate themed games like mini golf and board games, and yes of course, Pirates of the Caribbean! And this game is a combo because it's also Lego AND a video game! It just keeps getting better. I had technically picked the game up sometime in 2021 with the intention of a percenting it, but dropped it and then picked it back up later to finish mid-2022. What is it with these LEGO games, man? They're so funny and just full of fun puzzles and level design based on your favorite movies. It's pretty crazy how these games still wildly hold up today. Even the older ones, like LEGO Star Wars. If you have any franchise that you enjoy that's been turned into a LEGO game, I highly recommend playing them, because you're never too old to be playing such whimsically fun-filled games like the LEGO games.
talk about a hidden gem of a game. I'm actually not too clear if the World Wide Web of gamers acknowledge this game yet or not, but if not, they really should. There aren't a ton of movie tie-in games that are great, maybe like one or two, but this one is probably the best of the bunch. Playing through a whole world of normal sized objects but at the size of a toy brings a really fun perspective to the level design that's introduced throughout this game. On top of that, it's a collectathon, my favorite, and it has a soundtrack that has no right being as good as it is. Like why did they go so unbelievably hard on this game in every aspect? Except the character models, those things are hideous. By the way, I'm curious, I'd love to go more in depth with this game and other movie tie-in games. Let me know down in the comments if that's something you'd like to see or talk about. Welcome back, Shantae! The fourth entry in the Shantae series, Half Genie Hero, is the first game to take a step away from the pixel art in lieu of vector art, a change I find most welcome to the series. But what I don't find to be a welcome change is the structure of the game itself. Why did they just suddenly decide to make everything level based? It's so weird to me and just doesn't feel appropriate for what the game could be. I guess its predecessor, Pirate Curse, had a similar structure, but to me it felt more natural, like you were exploring a world. Here it just feels like you're replaying levels instead of revisiting an area you've already been. It just doesn't feel good. Outside of that, the actual levels are really fun, and just like usual, the music is an absolute bop. But man, it's like two steps forward, one step back when it comes to this game. At least you guys now know that the other two are higher, but which one is higher than the other? Hmm. <laughs> Wait, what? A decent Sonic game? Well, paint me blue and release me into the wild. I reckon I've gone plumb mad. Yeah, unfortunately, Sonic suffers from rarely having a decent enough game to even consider owning. Like, I feel yucky even having this game in my possession. But this game, this game is good. They kind of messed it up a little at the end if you play the game on hard. But outside of that, this game is a fun open world experience where you run around collecting various items to help your friends. And then you get in these awesome battles where you fight giant bosses and then the music kicks in and you're like let's go and then a few minutes later you're vibing with big the cat over here like ah this is nice. It just kind of sucks that after you beat the game, there's really nothing for you to do. You could go out of your way to S rank every stage, but it's not that difficult and you get the platinum trophy without doing them anyway. Even with that grievance though, Sonic Frontiers is honestly worth recommending as a Sonic game and something I look forward to returning to properly in the future to S rank everything. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go fishing. Yo, is that the 10 commandments? As promised from the bit picking video, Pokemon Scarlet is number 39 on my list. There isn't a ton here to say that I didn't already say in the last video, but to summarize, this game may be a broken mess, but it's a pretty fun broken mess with a really fun open world to explore and a pretty good story for Pokemon. On top of that, when you're done with the game, there's actually quite a bit of post game content that you can do. This game has definitely reignited my interest in Pokemon and I look forward to whatever they bring to the table next. Let's just pray they have better starting outfits this time. This may be a bit of a controversial take, but I really like Overwatch 2. But to be fair, I really like the first Overwatch, and both of these games are practically the same thing, except they did this. Really, my biggest problem with this game is how insanely overpriced everything is. You can literally buy a real life keychain for cheaper than the keychain in the game. What? Blizzard being a money grubbing evil corporation? Who would have thought? Regardless of what you think of Blizzard and their practices, Overwatch is still a fun team building game and was the game that weaned me off controller to finally start getting good at mouse and keyboard. Even though I'm a filthy casual that's only good on support roles. <laughs> Back 
into the action with some more LEGO, but this time with a modern 2022 game. This is where the fun begins. The original LEGO Star Wars games were so much fun, so when they announced that they were going to make a new one with all nine movies, I was ecstatic. Even though the last three movies exist, LEGO Star Wars found a way to make them actually entertaining, as per the norm with anything LEGO. So there were many great moments that had me actually belly laughing. No! Along with the top-notch humor, the galaxy is free for you to explore, with planets you can openly walk around in, missions to do, space battles, and a ton of levels. There's so much to do! And that shows in my final time of 68 hours at 100% completion. Do yourself a favor and don't shrug this game off because it has LEGO in the title. It's a phenomenal game. Remember, the Force will be with you. Always. <laughs> a lot of opportunities to talk about any games very often because I feel like I devote a lot of my time to big games I haven't had a chance to play yet, or new games that are constantly coming out. But when I was recommended a game that is the embodiment of The Legend of Zelda and Dark Souls with a pixel art style, I had to check it out. Unsighted is just that. There are dungeons to explore with Zelda-esque puzzles, but the combat is very akin to an action RPG like Dark Souls or Bloodborne. But there's one more catch. You'll notice in the top right corner is a clock. You see, this game runs on a time system, and the importance of of that system will depend on certain items you may or may not miss throughout the game. Without giving away too much, almost everyone in the game is a robot that is slowly running out of power, and every time you talk to someone, it will tell you how much longer they have to live. This includes merchants and side quest givers, so if you're not quick enough or you don't find a way to help, you could end up losing an item, a quest, or even a friend. This mechanic alone was enough to sell me on giving this game a try, and I highly recommend you do too. But be warned, this game isn't that easy. the Nino Kunai series. It's like walking into a Studio Ghibli movie. I want to go ahead and say up front that the first Nino Kunai is not on this list, and if it was, I can guarantee you that it'd be below this game. I love the first game, but I didn't find the combat with the familiars all that fun in the original. I was more just enthralled with the world and its story, but in this game I loved everything about it. Every character, the combat, the world, the kingdom builder, the music, everything in this game made me just want to crawl inside of my TV and live there forever. However, However, I will say that Mr. Drooby is a way better companion. <laughs> I thought that I would get tired of all the quests and kingdom builder stuff in this game, but the more I kept playing, the more I fell in love with the whole system, and I couldn't stop. I guess that's just one thing you need to keep in mind when you play this game that may annoy you. It's quite literally five games in one. There are a ton of different things it throws at you, but I promise it's all worth it in the end. Also, I didn't know where to put this, but can we talk about this amazing song? It sounds like it's straight from a ballroom and then a western showdown breaks out for no reason. So beautiful. When Clock came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Club was so talented and smart at following directions that he decided to let the narrator describe his feelings about the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe while he continued to play the game. Club thinks that the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe is a very smart and clever game, especially with its wide array of changes it may compare to the original Stanley Parable. He says there are a slew of different endings and routes you can take. He also says that the game is worth every ounce of your time to try and find all of them. Club also says that he thinks the game is one of the funniest games of all time, and that the narrator is the most handsome narrator he has ever heard. This club guy may be the smartest person in the world. It's 
amazing how we can go from being the stupidest person in the Wheel of Fortune bit to now being the smartest. Anyway, you should do him a favor and subscribe. Club, thank you for your kind words. Now let's see how stupid and insufferable you are for choosing games above the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. Could you also do me a favor and get out of the broom closet? That place gives me nightmares. Man, I love the exaggerated swagger of Insomniac Games. Miles Morales is the half-sequel to Marvel Spider-Man that comes off as kind of a tech demo for the PS5, even though they did also make it available for the PS4. I only mention this because this game is very short, like extremely short. You can beat the game in 7 hours while fully completing the game in about 18 hours, compared to the original 17 hours to beat and 34 hours to complete. Basically I'm saying this is half a game sold at full price, and that's not to say that a game's playtime denotes its value, it's just when the original game releases a DLC that's practically the same content and length as its sequel, and the sequel costs double the price, it comes off as pretty shady. Okay, let's set that aside and talk about the actual game. It's phenomenal. Of course it is, why else would I put it this high up on the list? It's a great game. The web swinging is exhilarating, the combat is fun and engaging, and the story is top notch. I do feel like we could have gotten some more OG Spider-Man villains, but they're they're probably saving them for the sequel. If you enjoyed the first Spider-Man game, you're going to love this one, because Insomniac does a really good job at making you really feel like... Trust me, this isn't the first time you're going to be seeing weird games side by side like this. Oh, uh, oops. Okay, yeah, when you put them side by side like that, it does look ridiculous, but let me explain myself. First of all, as a reminder, this list is entirely based on what I think is collectively more enjoyable of an experience or fun to me, not what I think is an actual overall good game. Second, I constructed this list by going, hmm, do I like Pokemon Scarlet over Sonic Frontiers? Yes! but not more than Overwatch 2. And third, I am a certified idiot, and I'm very aware of that. Now, about Fortnite itself, this game, regardless of what you think about it, has been going and going strong for over five years with no sign of stopping, which is insane. It has received several story updates, as ridiculous as they are, several game changes, like new maps, weapons, abilities, functions, accessibility options, different game modes, and so on, and continues to do so to this day. That's not to mention the countless number of skins, emotes, and other cosmetics that are honestly pretty fairly priced. The game is a blast to play with friends, as long as you play on no build mode, and it's even better when you clutch that victory royale. I even put over 100 hours into this game in 2022 alone after only picking it back up in September. I can go on and on, but the long short of it is, comparing Miles Morales to Fortnite is dumb, because they are two completely different games, unless you count the fact that Spider-Man is actually in Fortnite. Plus, Kurt, you're literally playing Fortnite right now. That's how I feel about everything you just said to me. Um, fuck you. What happens when you take the animation studio Ember Lab, you know, the one that made that one Majora's Mask animation a while ago, and then you mix them with Dark Souls and Pixar? You get Kina, Bridge of Spirits, a breathtakingly beautiful game filled with whimsical delight. Kina, Bridge of Spirits, as I said, comes from the studio Ember Lab, mostly known for their animations who are breaking out into video games. And may I say, they really stepped up to the plate and knocked it out of the park on their first try. You travel a semi-open world, solving puzzles and fighting enemies and collecting the cutest little balls of fur that help you to get around in the world. You can even give them cute little hats! And since this game originated from a company that did animation, of course all the cutscenes and character models are absolutely gorgeous. What an absolutely brilliant game. I just wish I heard more people talking about it. Probably the closest AAA game I could compare to this would be Star Wars Fallen Order. So if you're a fan of that game, I definitely recommend this game.
speaking of action adventure games, we've got Demon's Souls, or more specifically, the Demon's Souls remake from Blue Point Games for the PS5. What a stunningly beautiful remake. I swear they're getting better and better at this the more they do. But let's not focus too much on that and focus on the actual game itself. This game, originally made by From Software, was the starting point for the Souls-like games which spawned Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring. And also sparking my joy for the hard-to-beat, fun-to-master series. I also kind of feel like these games just made me better at video games as a whole. So once I finally got my hands on the PS5, I was eager to finally give this game a chance. And is it me or does this game seem a lot easier than its future titles. Like, after I beat it, I was just baffled that I didn't struggle as much as I did in my first playthrough of the first Dark Souls or Sekiro. I can at least say that the complete lack of a decent way to heal yourself was pretty annoying, reminding me of how good we have it with systems like the Estus Flask in future games. Regardless on if I'm insane or not about the difficulty, the game, much like all of From's games, is an absolutely fantastic game. This being the first definitely makes it show its age with some of the design decisions, but other than that, mastering this game is just as fun as mastering the others. Surprise! It wasn't Seven Sirens! And I bet you thought it would be. Especially how I gushed about Pirates a while ago. But no, this is definitely my second favorite Shantae game. It really honestly stems from the problem I had with Half Genie Hero. The way the world is structured feels very disjointed. Like at least in the first two games, you could travel from one point of the map to the other and everything felt connected. But in Half Genie and Pirate Curse, we're doing a level select screen for some reason. There really needs to be a middle ground on this. Both things seem like good ideas, but they're just too far one way. If you haven't figured out the solution already, don't worry, we'll talk about it later. Outside of the basic structure of the game, Pirate Curse doesn't actually come off as a level-based game like Half Genie does. Each part of the world can be re-explored in different ways as you obtain new abilities to traverse said world. There's also so many great character moments in the game, like having to team up with Risky and who can forget Run Run Roddy Tops. Speaking of that, the music in this game goes way harder than any of the other games, with several callbacks to past songs like the Dungeon theme and the Watertown theme, which is now Sky's theme. The gameplay and platforming is fun and engaging, the environments and levels are interesting, and the bosses and characters are hilarious. But let it be known, I now understand why people love this game so much. I got to play Cuphead's DLC with Crunchyroll Hime, and uh, it went about as well as you'd think it would. But hey, I had a great time, and I hope she had at least a little bit of fun. Right, Hime? No. After that stream, I went on to play through the rest of the DLC by myself, and just like the standard game, it was a fun, creative, agonizing time. Similar to the Souls games, I find that with games like these that are meant to be hard are also meant to really get under your skin. Yes, you could give up and come back later, but that boss is going to be just as hard an hour later as he is right now. In fact, it's probably going to be worse because you stepped away and now you have to relearn all its moves. That's why my go-to strategy is to just tough it out and keep going until you hear that lovely <laughs> music to my ears. But yeah, Cuphead's Delicious Last Course, or DLC, is fantastic. Just more Cuphead goodness. You're a kid now, you're a squid now, you're a kid, you're a squid, you're a kid, you're a squid. Oh, wait, sorry, I forgot. That was a previous ad. Now it's... Blah, 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 blah.
Regardless of Nintendo's weird marketing strategy for Splatoon 3, this game, much like both of its predecessors, is fresh as hell. I will admit that it took me a while to get used to the new hosts, Shiver and Fry, but much like Marina and Pearl, I grew accustomed to them very quickly. Although I do feel the need to point this out, but why does one of the co-hosts' forehead just keep getting bigger? The game still hosts an absolutely insane story mode per the norm, with an even more ridiculous final extra mission that I did complete, but we all know that's not the main appeal of Splatoon, it's the multiplayer, baby! And while the overall fundamentals of multiplayer has stayed the same, there have been a ton of quality of life improvements that should have been there since Splatoon 2, but Nintendo doesn't understand how online multiplayer works! <clears throat> Either way, it's fixed now and online is easily accessible to play with friends and competitively if you really hate yourself. An all around great time, especially if you can get some friends together to play Splatfest like Taco vs Burrito vs Nacho, which isn't real but I wish it was. Hmm. Oh, there's also Salmon Run, which is Splatoon's COD Zombies mode, except at the end, sometimes there's a- Oh no, oh, oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 no! <laughs> Hey Zach, I thought you were from Kingdom Hearts. Where are you actually from? Me? Gungaga. Teehee, I'm so funny and original. I definitely haven't heard him say those same lines over and over again online. That's not even funny, man. The last game I played of 2022. I had absolutely fallen in love with Final Fantasy VII after playing the remake, and I went ahead and sought out the original, played it, loved it, but was confused. Wasn't there supposed to be more Zack? I knew he was in Kingdom Hearts, so he had to be more important than just a few cutscenes, and lo and behold, there was a PSP only game I didn't know about. Womp womp, handheld game. I was dead set to play this game before Final Fantasy VII Rebirth came out, and would you look at that, they remade it for consoles. It's almost like the information from the game may be important for the new game. Who would have thought? Now I went into this game almost completely blind. All I really knew about it was Zack was in it, and that there was some weird slot machine in the top left corner, so I was a little worried that the game would play a little too much like a PSP game. But no, not really. The combat and gameplay is actually really solid. Turns out they did a Zack fair amount of tweaking to help players coming from Final Fantasy VII Remake enjoy this game, and I think they did a spot on job. The combat in this game feels just as good as it did in that game, and the slot machine aspect actually didn't ever feel like it was too unfair. The only thing that felt a little out of place to me was every time the game felt the need to add some weird mini game. Like one time when they ask you to Metal Gear your way into the warehouse and I proceed to trigger the guards every single time. Or the time where they're like, I know that an airstrike is coming that I just called, but here's a cool thing you can do. Pick up every item you can on your way to save your friend's mom and you can keep anything that you pick up along the way, but better be quick. Oh, she's dead. It's so weird and jarring, but outside of that, the gameplay is fantastic. And of course, I've got to talk about the stellar story. I feel like anytime I play anything Final Fantasy VII or Kingdom Hearts, I just get so invested invested in the story that I have to pause the game and put the mental puzzle pieces together. So Sephiroth is part of the Genova project, but so is Genesis, but they're actually part of two completely different versions of the experiment. So that's why Genesis is degrading and Sephiroth isn't. But Sephiroth doesn't know any of this, so when he does he has a mental breakdown- I'm just going to let him rattle for a bit. Kid, are you bored? Yeah! Do you want joy and fun brought back into your life? Yeah! Do you want your parents to love you again? What? Then you need Shovel Knight! Shovel Knight? Shovel Knight is a new cool 2D platformer by Yacht Club Games. It has tubular levels, radical bosses, and gnarly music. Awesome! So what are you waiting for, kid? Get your copy of Shovel Knight today! I can't wait to get my hands on Shovel Knight! <sighs> this, uh, this isn't exactly what I thought it'd be. Ooh, a whole chicken. 
As I said during the Plague Knight segment, I own Shovel Knight on several different platforms, so I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that I love this game. Every level is masterfully crafted, along with the expressive bosses and ultra catchy music. There's just so much attention to detail at every corner of this game. Every time I play Shovel Knight, I fall right back in love with it. I honestly just wish I was good enough to try and platinum the game. Some of the requirements they ask you to do are insane. I may be good at the game, but I'm not beat the game without dying good. Either way, if you have that itch for hard but fair retro platforming, then this is the game for you. It just keeps getting better. When I was playing through all of these, I remember this one being my favorite, but if you couldn't already tell, there's still one left. Regardless of that, Spectre of Torment is the same Shovel Knight goodness, except now you can play Tony Hawk Pro Skater using a scythe. In all seriousness, the fighting style of Spectre Knight feels so fluid and fun to use. How he zips across lanterns and enemies, and how he can climb up walls. It makes it feel like you're pulling off all these sick and nasty combos, when in reality, it's fairly simple to do. Spectre of Torment also has a pretty interesting story compared to Plague of Shadows and Shovel Knight, leaning to a more sorrowful story than others. And of course, it's filled with banging songs and remixes that'll be stuck in your head the entire time you're playing. But nothing compares to... I know, weird turn for Shovel Knight, but it works. This DLC has two different things going for it at the same time. While you have your normal levels like you would for any of the other DLCs, King of Cards also has this very creative card game that you can play with NPCs to help you get more abilities throughout the normal levels. It's a spectacular idea, but it gets better. It's completely optional. If cards aren't your thing, you can completely skip it. With the levels themselves, they actually changed it up a little this time. Instead of one long themed level, they decided to do multiple themed shorter levels. I personally like this format better, and I feel like it matches a lot better with King Knight and the type of character he is and the type of moves he can do. With shorter levels, that means more ideas and levels based on those ideas. So that leaves us with a ton of different ideas fit for each independent level, instead of playing multiple levels with the same exact idea. All in all, Shovel Knight and its extra stories are a solid package, with a lot to offer. If you're ever in the mood for a great platformer, I highly recommend picking up Shovel Knight Treasure Trove, which features every Shovel Knight game I I talked about in this video. Super Smash Brothers! You guys know it. I know it. Heck, even your great Aunt Martha, who you only see on the holidays, knows it. I sure do. Oh, man. That was a weird case of deja vu. I can't help it, man. Smash is great. I get so hyped every time there's a trailer, and if anyone is like, yo, man, you want to smash? I'm like, hell yeah, I do. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that was funny. <laughs> I can't... <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, okay. I've put so many hours into Smash Ultimate, and most of that time was me getting my butt served to me on an open platter, but you know what? I don't care, because I'm still able to play a game with friends where I can play as Sora or Joker and brutally beat up Steve from Minecraft. I will say I do miss the campaign from Brawl and all its beautiful CG cutscenes, but I guess in a way we still get those cutscenes through the wonderfully crafted reveal trailers they made. It's unfortunate that we probably won't have anything new Smash for a long time, but in my opinion, that's okay, because Sakura I gave us a truly wonderful game with so many characters and so many cameos with an endless amount of combinations we could ever possibly want for matchups. Daddy Sakurai, you take that long, well-deserved rest. You earned it. Oh, wait, what? He started a YouTube channel? Damn it, I knew rebranding my channel was a bad idea. How am I going to compete with that? Keep 
keeping up with the trend of multiplayer games, we now have a game I'm actually good at. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe has been a hot topic of late, purely because Nintendo made the best commercial decision they've made in a long time. Instead of releasing a new Mario Kart for $60, they decided to just release an entire Mario Kart's worth of tracks for the price of DLC, and release them over the course of two years. And I love this idea! I had been itching for new Mario Kart tracks, and as of writing this video, they've already released some of my favorites, like Coconut Mall and Maple Treeway. This reignited my love for Mario Kart, and I've been playing it pretty consistently ever since they started dropping courses. As far as Mario Kart goes as a game, what can I say that you don't already know? Drive car as Nintendo character, throw banana, manipulate weather, get first place. It's that easy. Multiplayer games just keep getting better. I mean, I guess that's how it works. It is a ranking after all. You know what I love just as much as video games? Board games. Lots and lots of board games. And what better way to get my attention than to marry the two ideas together? While Super Mario Party was all right, Mario Party Superstars is mwah, magnifique. Why create a new Mario Party if people are going to get mad if you could just remake a bunch of old maps, throw in a ton of mini games throughout all the Mario Parties, and bim bam boom, you got to yourself a wanna hot the pipe and a pizza pie. Not only that, but Nintendo finally figured out how to do online multiplayer with Mario Party. About time. If for whatever reason you leave or get kicked from a match instead of the game just ending or you just can't get back in, an AI will take your spot while you're gone. And when you get back, you can jump right back into the action. I'm telling you, this better be how all future Mario Party titles are because this is exactly how it should be done. I think you'd seen the last of the pirates in this video, but nay, you've been boarded by Captain Club! <laughs> Come with me on an adventure as we go to find me booty! <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't understand! What the heck is this? Tee pirate game. Who would have thought that the multiplayer pirate game was going to be so high on this list? I don't play a lot of games on Steam, but of all the games I did play in 2022, 83% of them was Sea of Thieves. And in total, I've put 850 hours into this game since I picked it up in 2020. To me, there is so much to Sea of Thieves. The friends you meet while you're sailing, or perhaps the enemies you make. The adventure of claiming a gold vault or solving a mystery with Jack Sparrow. The thrill of battling skeletons or fighting off phantoms. 
mountains, or just simply enjoying a nice sunset with your crew members. Sea of Thieves for me is a new adventure every time I boot up the game. Yes, you could give yourself goals like becoming pirate legend or hoarding enough gold to buy that really expensive item you want, or grinding milestones to grab that trinket you want for your ship, but at its core, Sea of Thieves is quite literally about the journey, rather than the destination. But sometimes you have some really toxic jerks who just sink you because they think you look like an easy target. Joke's on you, bud. I am an easy target. Wait. No, not that Donkey Kong Country, this Donkey Kong Country. I think this is the game I was playing as a kid whenever I suddenly gained sentience because I can't remember playing anything before this. And my mom always tells the story about how I'd get up and smack my butt in victory every time I beat a level. It's no wonder I haven't been able to get any friends. Donkey Kong Country is an absolutely phenomenal platformer by Rare and probably what initially sparked my joy for video games and more specifically video game music. I mean, it's been talked to death, but David Wise's aquatic ambience is an art masterpiece that should be discussed for years and years to come, especially with all the hurdles he had to jump just to get that song to work on an SNES cartridge. Besides gushing about David Wise, Donkey Kong Country is a game that I can constantly come back to, beat it in an hour, and feel like that was the best hour I had had all week. I only have one small bit pick with Donkey Kong Country, and that's its last stage, Chimp Caverns. It doesn't feel too original, since it's the only stage without a new themed level, deciding to instead go for repeated assets for all the levels. So I I usually end up dreading that stage since it's not all that interesting, but outside of that small grievance, Donkey Kong Country is definitely worth your time. And there you have it, the final Shantae game, and let me say, this. This is what I wanted Shantae games to be from the very beginning. The game's map is a blend of the first two games' idea of having the entire world open and connected together, and the next two games' idea of having different items bring you back to previous levels. So yes, a Metroidvania. To me, it's always felt like Shantae should have been that from the very beginning, and I guess I absentmindedly assumed that's how the game was before I even started playing. So I was pretty happy when I started playing Seven Sirens and found out that's exactly how the game works. It wasn't until a few years before that I discovered my love for Metroidvanias when I played Hollow Knight, and I've been slowly going through several games with similar mechanics. And just a quick reminder for anyone who doesn't know what a Metroidvania is, a huge open map with a bunch of blocked off areas that require you to get an item in one area of the map to unlock something in another area of the map. So to me, unlocking a bunch of different transformations to be used to help you progress further into this new world they've given you to explore was 100% the right move. Seven Sirens even streamlined the transformations to being a simple button push or a two button combination, something I super appreciated since you're swapping transformations all the time. The music is also extremely cool because a ton of the songs mix together 8-bit and orchestral for a really nice sounding OST. The story is also pretty captivating, giving you a fairly nice goal to work towards, and the world is brimming with tons of expressive characters and NPCs. Oh, and I completely forgot to mention, Squid Baron is the best character in the entire Shantae series, and I will fight any of you who say otherwise. Crash is back, baby, and it's one of the hardest games I've ever tried to platinum! I'm diving straight into my biggest problem with this game. Why? Why did they think it was cool to ask us to not only beat every level without dying more than three times, but to do that twice for each level, and then to beat each level perfectly by grabbing everything, including boxes, fruits, and hidden gems, and you can't die a single time. And you also have to get every platinum relic. Why? 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 Wow. The other Crash games are pretty reasonable with their difficult platinum trophies, but this game is on a whole other level of big asks. It's just too much, and it's the only Crash game I refuse to 100%. But here's the kicker. Every time I beat this game, I'm sad because I want more, when I know the clear answer to wanting more is to play through the game and get 100%. Outside of the end content of the game, the game is a phenomenal joy to new and old players. It's so nice to see so much love and attention to detail 
detail the levels, characters, music, and cutscenes got for this game. It makes me super happy to be a fan of the little weasel, and I hope he gets another mainline sequel in the near future. Good job Toys for Bob, it's real nice to see that you've decided to go back to making good games. It's been a while since Madagascar Golf. for scary month, I always get a real urge to play a scary themed game. Not a scary game though, those are scary and they scare me, but a scary themed game. You know, Medieval, Luigi's Mansion 3, Little Nightmares, The Haunted Mansion, Bloodborne, Nintendog. So for this year, I decided to play the original Luigi's Mansion, cause it had been a few years and at this point in the year I was feeling a little sick and wanted something nice to lift my spirits. <laughs> Ah, no one told me this game had spirits! Luigi's Mansion still holds up pretty solid after all these years, with tons of rooms to explore, and tons of gold to collect, and tons of ghosts to suck up, and tons of boo tongues to look at. So many tongues. There's something very satisfying about going through an overly stuffed mansion and draining it of all its ghosts and resources, all in a search to find Mario. I personally feel like each of the installments of Luigi's Mansion have gotten better and better, and with that, this game does show its age a tiny bit with its controls, but honestly, it's not bad enough to knock the game down even a little. All in all, Luigi's Mansion is a truly excellent game showcasing the best Mario brother in all his green glory. Let's just maybe be a little smarter about supposed prizes we've won in the future, eh Luigi? No. You know, I don't normally want to do my house chores, but you better believe I'll do them in Animal Crossing. This game was never on my radar, but once the disease that shan't be named hit the nation, everyone was playing Animal Crossing and I wanted in on the action. I've never really been one to gravitate towards these endless games of self goals, or I guess in better terms, life sim games. But once I started playing, this game really drove its hooks into me. I would play it on and off every few months and I still do to this day. My town still isn't done in my eyes, but I did see the end game credits, so I I guess I technically beat it, but like I said, the game is literally designed to be never ending and give me something to play every day. For me it was always the fishing, something about seeing new fish in the aquarium is just so satisfying to me. The game as a whole is so pleasant and charming and filled with so many activities to do and items to collect. I completely understand if this isn't the type of game for you, since I literally had to pry myself away from the game since it was turning into more of a chore than a good time. Either way, if you need something to ease your mind and just chill out for a few hours, then look Look no further than paying off this money grubbing rodent. Spider Man, Spider Man, can he swing? No, he can't. I'm going to die. Marvel Spider Man, the absolute 100%, without a doubt, hands down best Spider Man game, right next to Spider Man 2 and Spider Man Big Wheel Simulator. Spider Man is my favorite Marvel franchise. I consumed Spider Man content as a kid, and I continue to do so today. So the idea of Insomniac releasing a AAA Spider Man game got me so excited. And of course, they knocked it out of the park with one of the best Spider Man stories we've had in a while, and a plethora of stuff to do in the city, and intense and fun combat mechanics. This game is like a 
a Spider-Man wonderland. Everything about it from start to finish is, shall I say, spectacular. Except for the fact that they replaced my man John Bubniak with Ben Jordan in the remake. Why'd they gotta go and do that? It's so weird playing the two side by side. Honestly, I got pretty used to it and he doesn't look that bad, but I know in my heart who the true Spider-Man is. In the end, Marvel Spider-Man is truly an amazing experience that I can feel myself coming back to every other year. Heck, I'll even boot up the game every now and then just so I can swing around the city. Probably one of the only games that feels so good that I feel the need to jump in and experience it on a regular basis. Because you know, the game makes you really feel like... No. I love Xenoblade Chronicles. I love how it can go from this super serious moment to moments like <laughs> Guys what do you think you're doing? And it's absolutely stunning. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 decided to take a slight step back from Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and focus on less Japanese quirkiness in lieu of focusing on a more grounded and intense story. And that's these RPGs main pool, right? A great story. Something I feel like all Xenoblade Chronicle games have. The one thing about this game that really gets me though is that it comes off and was advertised as a conclusion to the Xenoblade Chronicles story. Which if I'm going to be perfectly honest, no. No it doesn't. It hardly felt like a continuation at all to the other games, but I digress. Let's talk about the story outside of that. Thrilling, puzzling, gut-wrenching, just like the other games, the story is masterfully beautiful. If you love character-driven stories, then you'll love this one. The combat is tight and the music is tighter, with the music having a heavy influence on the world and the characters around it. Really, I feel like I could talk about this game in great detail from the Ouroboros idea for combat and the ability to switch character roles, to talking about each of the characters and the impact they have on the story, but for the sake of the video, I'll leave you on one last thing. The only part that I didn't really enjoy came from the combat with the chain attack sequence. It never felt quite as satisfying to pull off a big hit or big combo like it did in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and the music for chain attacks got really annoying really quickly. But speaking of Xenoblade Chronicles 2... Right off the top, no, I didn't play Xenoblade Chronicles this year, so it's not on the list. But believe me, it'd be somewhere around here. I'm really itching to go in deep about all three games for a video someday, but I feel like that might take several months of my time. But who knows, maybe in the future. For now, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Now place your hand on my chest. What? I love the random Japanese quirkiness. It was one of my favorite parts of this game and I really missed it in 3, but I think I only miss it because it made this game's characters feel a little bit more real in a weird sort of way. It just kind of gave them more personality. I enjoy almost every character in this game and everything about their story. In Xenoblade 3, I didn't really become quite as attached to my party except for a few characters. Honestly, the only thing holding back Xenoblade 2's story is Rex and his voice actor. Ah! Yeah, not too sure how we went from I'll kill you! to The gameplay has this super interesting idea for becoming more powerful. You see, while you can swap roles in Xenoblade 3, this game does it in a pretty cool way, a la Pokemon. So there are drivers and then there are blades, and blades can be swapped out for more powerful blades, and they can also be collected as well, but each one has different abilities and types that they can use as well. On top of that, and this is my favorite part, they each have their own story. Unlike Pokemon, which are just like animals or something, blades have souls. They're a species that has sentience who can talk, think, and act on their own. The blade play a very pivotal role to the story, and I find their dynamic with their drivers to be far more interesting than the story in Xenoblade 3. Xenoblade 3 is good, but I feel like Xenoblade 2 did an overall way better job with story, combat, and music. But it certainly didn't do good with the opening act. The amount of tutorials and terrible voice acting in the first four hours of the game is a real turnoff. What a shame. Now, it's time for the top 10. You know, we, we've done a lot of bits here, and uh, I was going to do another pirate bit, but I've already talked about the pirates so many times, and the video is already really long, so 
I didn't think there really needed to be another pirate bit, so this is me saying that uh, officially there will be no pirate bit for uh, Donkey Kong Country 2. <laughs> Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. Wait, I thought it was always Diddy Kong's Quest. Huh, who knew? What a truly masterful game by Rare. I remember this game being so hard when I was a kid. I struggled and struggled to beat it, and when I did, the satisfaction of beating it set into motion my love for difficult games. I recognize that this game is difficult, but trust me, there are way harder games out there. Everything about this game is artful. The level design, the backdrop, the gameplay, the music, oh my gosh, the music. This soundtrack has got to be one of, if not the best video game soundtrack of all time. Songs like Sticker Brush Symphony, Lockjaw Saga, Bio Boogie, Forest Interlude, the list goes on. Donkey Kong Country 2 continues to be one of my favorite 2D platformers to this day, and I believe it will continue to do so. Nothing will ever beat watching that final sunset at the end of the game, knowing I just had one of the greatest video game experiences of all time. Keeping up with the childhood influenced games, we have Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back. Now I had all three mainline Crash games as a kid, and even then I knew this game was a heavy step up from the original. In Crash 2 I feel like I have way better control over Crash, with crouching and slide jumping to get extra height. The depth perception also doesn't feel as off in this game as it does in Crash 1. However, there are a select few instances that it does seem just a little bit off. But in the end, Crash 2 simply contains way better level design. And because of that, the gems in the game are actually fun to collect and don't ask too much of the player, making it entirely possible for younger me to live out my dreams of blowing up the Cortex Vortex. In the Crash Insane trilogy, I even think that the relics translated a lot better over to Crash 2 than they did for Crash 1, and that's honestly because of how weirdly Crash 1 feels compared to its successors. Speaking of successors... Crash Bandicoot Warped is the best Crash Bandicoot game and I won't let anyone tell me any different. Seriously, the level theming is better, the bosses are better, the main hub is better, Crash's moves are better, the actual levels themselves are better, the music is better, everything is better! Crash 3's levels are absolute perfection. The idea of traveling through time was such a great idea because it led to some great level themes, like medieval themed, dinosaur themed, future themed, motorcycle themed. Sure, whatever. It's probably nostalgia talking, especially since this was my first PlayStation game, but I just can't help it. This game is the embodiment of everything that Naughty Dog had been working on for the Crash series, and it all built up to create the perfect 3D platformer. Bet you didn't expect to see this game so high on the list or at all. This game is good and you guys need to give it another shot. Believe me, I know how rough the launch was. I played it at launch and it was, it, it was bad. But playing this game on the PS5 today, I had zero problems. So let's not talk about glitches or bugs here because that's been fixed and it's quite frankly been talked to death. This game is beautiful. My spark to play this game again came around the time that the anime was released. I watched the anime twice, falling in love with all the characters and their story and I was like, you know, let's give this game a another chance, and I'm so glad I did. Everyone that's connected to V and his story feels so organic and natural. If there's anything this game taught me, it's that there are people out there that legitimately and genuinely care about you, no matter what you're going through. Yes, that even includes if you have Keanu Reeves stuck inside your head. Bravo to that man, he played a perfect Johnny Silverhand. I might even go as far as saying that Johnny Silverhand is one of my favorite video game characters. I feel bad I didn't get a chance to do Johnny's side quest, but I'm hoping to get around to doing that sometime in the future because I just love being in this world. A world full of bright lights, evil corporations, and sadness. It's 
it's a little close to home. But that only cements even further the connections you make with the people around you. Because no matter how crappy the world gets, you know that there's someone out there to talk to. And I want to extend that arm for any of you. If you ever need someone to talk to, feel free to reach out. I mean it. This world is crappy, and sometimes you may need someone to talk to, even when you feel like you don't need to. You're always free to message me personally, or if you'd like, you can join our Discord. I promise we have a very welcoming community there. <sighs> Sorry, I, I didn't mean to get so deep there. So listen, there's a ton more I could say about Cyberpunk, and it's many great things like combat and exploration, but I really would love for everyone to give this game a second chance. So go give it a try, and come back here and let me know what you think. This game is so good! Seriously, why didn't anyone tell me? This was my first entry into the roguelike games, and I really need to try out more after playing this one. Basically, if no one knows what a roguelike is, it's permadeath. If you die, you have to start over from the beginning, with the caveat being that you learn and get a little better every time. And you do have some things that stay with you even after death. I remember when I first beat up Daddy Dearest over here, I thought I'd beat the game, only to find out that you have to beat him 10 times. At the time, I thought that was impossible, especially considering how hard of a time I had beating him once. But as I came to find out, learning really is the fun part about this game. You learn how to make the randomness of what you get from room to room swing in your favor. And you learn how to get better and better at the game until you get to the point where you're effortlessly winning five times in a row. This game is so addictive and beyond good. I also wanted to briefly talk about the voice acting like I did in the Pokemon Scarlet bit picking video. I remember as I was playing through the game that I was blown away by just how much was voiced. Literally everything was voiced everything. And since you're dying all the time, you'd think you'd hear a lot of repeated dialogue, but I don't think I heard a single repeated line of dialogue in all of my hours of playing. Which is crazy because most of the voices provided for Hades are developers of the game. To be fair, I think the biggest reason I was really blown away was because the game I played right before this was Pokemon Arceus. So yeah. A bummer of a game, huh? I'm not sure what possessed me to play Majora's Mask, but I'm sure glad I did, because it had been a while since I just played a Zelda game to play a Zelda game. Most of the time I play them to come up with video ideas or for streaming or something, so it was nice to just sit down, relax, and get depressed. Sometimes I forget why I'm such a huge Zelda fan until I replay through one and it all comes rushing back to me. Every second that I'm in a Zelda world is truly magical, and this world specifically is so beautifully designed. All the townspeople with their tightly knitted schedules, the different tribes having to deal with their individual problems, and then there's you trying to save the people of a doomed world while simultaneously fixing their problems. There's something so pleasant about gathering masks, helping people have a better day by fixing their menial problems, and then between all that, do your usual Zelda thing of taking down challenging puzzles and dungeons. I love this game, and I love its wackiness and darkness that's melded together. Overall, this game is shadowed by an otherworldly sadness, but the joy of helping this sad world makes it all worth it in in the end. thought the game of the year winner towards the top of the list? Nah. This game consumed me in the two weeks I played it. In fact, I platinumed the game in that time, which I've been told is insane, but I did play through 60 games in 52 weeks, so I guess that adds up. Elden Ring deserves all the praise it gets, and then some. Playing it with friends on the first week of it coming out was so much fun because we all went in completely different directions and played in completely different ways. Elden Ring, in the most basic sense I can say, is Dark Souls played like Breath of the Wild, and by that I mean it's not as linear, and you're given free reign to explore the world from the very beginning, similar to Breath of the Wild. The world in this game is the biggest selling point, with tons and tons of stuff to do, explore, and so many ways to explore them. That always feels like the best part to a game like this. Every time you play, you can choose to do something completely different, giving you a different experience every time. You could go towards this castle on the south point of the map, or you could try to go towards the tree and fight the boss north of your starting 
starting point. Or if you're feeling really gutsy, you could try and tear through the area east of the starting point, filled with tons of abominations and super tough bosses. And even once you're inside more concealed areas like castles, I think that's where From Software's level design really shines through. We get to see more of the stuff that we're used to from past games with their expertly crafted levels. This entire game is a masterclass of how to make a good open world. Whether it's the UI, the map and how you get it, the enemies, the layout, the rewards for exploration, everything about this game is perfect and should be talked about for years to come. Because in my opinion, Elden Ring is the first game in a long time to innovate on a concept that has been beaten to death and rejuvenate life right back into it. Before we talk about the last three, I first wanted to thank you all for making it this far into the video, and that I hope you're enjoying it. And second, the next three games I actually didn't play in 2022. So Elden Ring is technically my favorite game of 2022, but the reason the next three are even on the list is because I knew when I started this ranking that they would be the top three no matter what. Because these are my favorite games of all time, and I didn't think there was any particular reason to not talk about them for the video. So let's wrap this ranking up with my top three. My favorite Zelda game of all time. The game that sparked my love for Zelda and what caused me to branch out and try more games in the future. I love this game from beginning to end. I recognize its flaws with the bug catching and the lengthy tutorial, but I will forever hold this game as the best Zelda game of all time. The dungeons are numerous and fun, the story is dark and beautiful, the characters are way more interesting than any other Zelda game, and the world and music are dazzling, mystical, and perfect. Twilight Princess is a game that I could get lost in for hours, and a game that I always look forward to replaying every time I boot it up. I could never get bored of this game. And Midna, oh my gosh Midna, best companion ever. Her story and character arc serve so much more purpose than any other character in the Zelda series. And let's talk about the dungeons. Some of the best dungeons in the Zelda series are here. Goron Mines, Snow Peak Ruins, Temple of Time, City in the Sky, Arbiter's Grounds. There are so many fantastic dungeons and I feel like they all still hold up just as well today as they did when the game came out. I could go on and on about this game, but I feel like we'd be here forever. I've had the idea of going through all the Zelda games one by one for a bunch of bit picking videos, but I'm curious. Is this something you'd be interested in? Let me know what you think. Ah, good old Kingdom Hearts. The series that opened the floodgates to Japanese weirdness for Little Club. Here specifically, we're talking about Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, a game I wasn't able to play until they released it in the US for the PS3 in 2014. But I did grow up with vanilla Kingdom Hearts 2 when I was a kid, and I remember seeing Final Mix online and wondering if it was some sick joke. Kingdom Hearts 2 is without a doubt the best Kingdom Hearts game. The ultra fluid combat system blends exceptionally well with the weird and kooky story that is Kingdom Hearts 2. As weird as it is, I'm I'm a Kingdom Hearts story nut. I consume that nonsense that comes out of Nomura's brain like candy. And I can recount the entire story starting from Birth by Sleep all the way up to Melody of Memory like it's nothing. Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix is one of the most fun and engaging games I have ever played, and its ties to the stories of the other games in the series only holds this game up higher on the podium. Things like Roxas and the other members of Organization 13 are wrapped in one of my favorite mysteries in gaming, and I love all of them. Yes, even you, Dimmix. As if. I also love that in Final Mix you can refight all the organization members in these really hard data battles. Fighting them off is always so satisfying and makes you feel like a real anime protagonist, even though I guess that's what you really are. This is another series I've thought about doing a bit picking episode for every game in the series, but I've also thought about streaming them as well. I'm a big ol' nut for Kingdom Hearts, so I'd love a way to gush about it some more. I liked Persona 5 before Joker was in Smash, so my opinion is valid. Sorry, had to get that off my chest before the pitchforks came in. You know what's funny? I had zero desire to play this game, and then I made one video on it a long time ago for work, and now here I am, proclaiming that it's my favorite video game. Persona 5 did one major thing that sparked my love for the game. It reignited my interest in turn-based RPGs. I detested them, thought they were the most boring means of playing a game imaginable, but this game showed me that when done right, it can be really fun and 
engaging. Persona 5 Royal, the upgraded version of Persona 5, is the technical version that's number one on my list. While you could play Persona 5, I would highly recommend Royal, since it adds about 25 hours of new content on top of a ton of quality of life improvements that were much needed for the game, making a nearly perfect game even more perfect. Let's briefly talk about the two sides of the coin this game is and why I love it. On one side is the dungeon crawling RPG part. Fighting enemies is not random and allies get shared XP. Boom! Done! It's already perfect. Besides that, the actual fights are pretty interesting, since you have a wide variety of different personas you can use to help you fight, so having a bunch ready at your disposal to attack enemy weaknesses is a must. But also, there's no switching out your persona and waiting a turn like in Pokemon. You just do it. Right then and there, on the spot. Need a lightning attack? Already have a lightning persona? Done! They're dead. Outside of combat, the dungeons are extremely interesting to explore, with each one having a distinctly different aesthetic and each filled to the brim with puzzles and traps. Now on the the other side of the coin is your daily life gameplay. Talk to friends, take tests, date a girl, go to the movies, eat a burger, do whatever you want. But here's the cool thing, everything you do is actively improving your abilities and personas you use in dungeons. Is that not the coolest thing or what? This game is an absolute gem and well worth your time. I would recommend it in a heartbeat and I don't know if there's going to be anything that can push this game off the number one spot for a very long time. If there's anything we learned from this video, it's that everyone's opinions on video games, or anything for that matter, is and always will be different from yours. But that's what makes us all human. None of us are the same, and we all have our tastes and preferences that just don't line up with everyone. It's honestly something I had to push myself to realize. Who cares what that one random person thinks? Or who cares what my buddy thinks about Bubsy 3D? In the end, it's your opinion that matters to you and only you. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But if you are interested in my ever changing opinion, I do keep my constantly updating list public for all to see. If you go to my Linktree link down below, and there you'll find a link to my video game library, where I post what game I'm playing, what I own, what I've played, and what my current ranking is. In that same Linktree are links to all my socials as well, so feel free to stop by wherever you find me and tell me how dumb and stupid I am for even considering putting Cyberpunk above Donkey Kong Country. Regardless, I hope you all enjoyed the video, and I hope you continue to have a chill day.